So in the start of chapter five, um, we're talking about the wave nature of matter, but actually we start chapter five by talking about um, the wave nature of X-rays. Remember that in that X-rays were discovered in 1895 by Röntgen, um, and they were recognized soon to be a form of radiation, higher energy radiation than previously um, previous radi radiation that was understood, and therefore shorter, um, higher energy, higher frequency, because energy equals H F, and uh, lower wavelengths, shorter wavelengths. So X-ray is short wavelength radiation. And we already jumped to Compton scattering in 1923, which used the X-ray to show that um, that the that the radiation has the energy shown above and um, momentum h over lambda, Planck constant over the wavelength of the radiation. So that was a Compton effect. Let's um, actually step back a little bit and say in the earlier 1900s when um, scientists were still trying to figure out exactly what x-rays were in uh, 1912 so it was it was 1912 Bragg showed indeed that elect that sorry x-rays had wave-like properties by scattering x-rays um, and showing off of off of surfaces and showing that they scattering mm, sorry showing that they interfere so let, let's remember so we're talking about um, the fact that both that that photons have both wave like and particle like properties what defines a wave one of the things that explicitly defines a wave something a wave property that um, matter does not have um, sorry, a, a wave property. Yeah, that that is that is not. Um, I guess I'm trying to think of the way to say it, but that, that is something that is explicitly shows that something is a wave. Is this idea of diffraction and near interference? Only waves diffract um, and interfere. Particles do not diffract and interfere. Waves do. And so, um, so because of the, the short wavelength high energy of the X-rays, it was difficult uh, to show the diffraction and air interference, but it was in 1912 um, and previous work by X. von Lau that showed indeed that X-rays both, um, that, that X-rays do indeed diffract and interfere, so X-rays are definitely a type of a wave. Okay, but the main point here is um, that throughout the the, the uh, late 1800s or early 1900s, while we're looking for evidence of quantum mechanics, X-rays are discovered, X-rays are studied, X-rays play a big part in the understanding of quantum physics. But um, I, here I want to start with just the fact that one of the properties of uh, that, that distinguishes a wave from something else is it, that it diffracts and interferes and talk a little bit about the Bragg scattering or the Bragg interference from, um, from, uh, from um, particles. So there's nothing inherently quantum mechanical about this uh, discussion in the first section of chapter 5, but it's connected to the, the discovery, the, the subsequent discovery that, or the subsequent recognition that particles also have wave-like properties. So Bragg scattering is about waves having wave-like properties. Um, so there's nothing new here except for the fact that, that Bragg scattering is about X-rays um, and the usefulness of X-ray crystallography. So the idea here is that crystals um, have, some, have some regular structure. So what I mean by that, that, that crystals have, have what are called crystal planes um, and that they're, there's sort of evenly spacing. So the, the uh, atoms in a crystal are evenly spaced in the way that I've drawn here. And this is, I've just drawn it in two dimensions. Of course, it is also in three dimensions. Um, 
to show uh, the scattering off of the crystal planes, it's easiest to draw it in two dimensions. So just imagine a, um, a lattice of evenly spaced atoms in three dimensions. And notice that, uh, that for a crystal, those crystal planes might be spaced at a distance, let's call it D. One of the things that we can do with electromagnetic radiation, in this case, X-rays were the right wavelength in order to be able to do this um, for a typical crystal plane spacing, is you can take that electromagnetic radiation, which we're, is a wave, right? You can take that electromagnetic radiation and you can reflect it off the surface of that crystal. I just drew it to, you know, indicate it's a wave, but indeed we just draw the rays and reflect it off the crystal. But what happens is, is that some of the radiation will reflect off of let's say the top crystal plane, and then some will go down and reflect off of the next crystal plane. So those two lines are supposed to be parallel. Indeed, the, um, the electromagnetic radiation may penetrate farther into the crystal, but the effects that we see is primarily due to the reflection off of two parallel crystal planes with a spacing of D take this single light ray and we reflect it off of the crystal, what happens is that the two reflections, and by the way, the law of reflection for light says that the angle of incidence, theta i, equals the angle of reflection, theta r, not angle of refraction, but reflection. This is just reflection. And so that's going to be true for the second ref reflected uh, light as well, which is why they come out parallel. Um, and the, what happens is that those two beams, so the single beam gets split into two, and those two beams, you can project them onto a screen, right? We've seen this kind of thing before. And they, whoops, not a screer, but a screen. And they will interfere. So they, they will create an interference pattern. They'll create an interference pattern on a screen. Because we now have two light sources, which are of the same wavelength, which are um, where, where one light source is going slightly farther than the other one. Um, and, uh, and they will interfere when they meet. At, uh, at a screen. Remember that interference has to do with the fact that um, if you have two sources, two uh, same sources, but one travels slightly, tra travels farther than the other, that when they meet, they add, and they will add in a way that depends on how much farther one has traveled than the other. We've done this kind of interference before. And again, let me just say that the reason why this, the x-rays in particular are useful for scattering off of the crystal planes, this Bragg scattering is for x-rays off of crystal planes, is because the x-rays are the right size to do this kind of scattering and to see an interference pattern. That interference um, occurs most prominently when the wavelength of the light is similar to is is similar to the distance change um, or the the the, the distance let's say the distance d for example the wavelength of the light is approximately equal to the distance d that's when you get no noticeable diffraction and noticeable interference um, example that I always like to give is that when you shine a, a light through a doorway. The, the light doesn't diffract, doesn't diffract terribly noticeably. Well, oh, what is diffraction? We didn't actually say interference. We know what interference is. We didn't remind you what diffraction was, right? Diffraction is when, um, when a wave spreads out due to the fact that it, um, is, that it goes through or, or around an object. Um, so, for example, let's just do a real quick aside. Say I have a, a light beam, let's call it a green light beam, and it, it is incident on this um, opening. What happens in the opening is the light beam will spread out um, through that opening, right? So that's diffraction, is the spreading of, an, of, of, a, of, a, of a wave when it goes through an opening, or it could be the, sp the spreading of the wave when it goes around an object. So let's say that we have an object and a light beam at it. When that light beam goes around the object, 
it will spread out around the object. Um, that's, that's essentially diffraction. And diffraction is most prominent when the wavelength of the light, when the wavelength of the light is um, similar to the size of the, um, of the obstruction. That's when it's most prominent. Um, so if you shine light through a door, the light is a, a much, 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 much smaller wavelength than the door. And we de tend not to see diffraction around a doorway, right? So if you, but uh, this was meant, meant to be just a light, uh, ceiling light in a room, and that light is, you know, goes through the doorway, um, that, that the light goes straight through. We don't really see this diffraction effect. It just goes straight through. Whereas sound, if you make a sound, the sound actually diffracts around the doorway. It's why it is, you can actually, it's one of the reasons. Of course, there's a lot of reasons. There's reasons of, of um, reflection and such like that. But sound, sound waves, wavelengths that are more like the, uh, the, the opening of a doorway. So sound will actually diffract through a doorway. In other words, let's look at a side view of this doorway. Sound waves, if we, if we go through a doorway, um, this is just supposed to be a side view of the doorway. Um, the sound waves, that was a bad one. Let's, let's try a top view, right here, whoops. Here's a top view of a doorway just like on the previous page, um, a light wave is going to travel straight through. So if you're on the other side of the doorway, if we've got a light and we're on the other side of the doorway, um, and here's an observer, um, and then let's put an observer over here. So there you go. I'm trying this. This example is getting too long, but the the light will tend to go straight through. An observer who is not in direct line of contact with light may not see the light. Whereas if it's sound, and I'm just drawing this light as gray and the sound is black, the sound waves because of their the virtue of their wavelength, the sound waves that come to the doorway will tend to spread out through the doorway because the sound waves are more like the size of the doorway because sound waves are, you know, might have a wavelength on the order of a meter, whereas light might have a wavelength on the order of, you know, 10 to the minus, what is it, 10 to the minus, um, 10 to the minus seven meters, right? So light doesn't spread out and the sound waves do through a doorway, do diffraction. Okay, back to Bragg scattering. So Bragg scattering, we've got reflection off of two crystal planes and because of that, the, the light, it's as if we uh, send light through We've, we've seen the two slit experiment before through two slits. Um, we've got two sources of light, which then will interfere. So in order to figure out how the interference pattern looks, we need to figure out how much farther one of these light waves has traveled relative to the other. So I just realized um, that I didn't quite draw this picture right. It's, the concept is correct, um, but uh, I didn't quite draw the picture right because uh, we're, we're, we need to show, and what I've shown is reflection off of the atoms, right? It's good. The reflection actually, it if, it, if it passes to the second plane, it's got to go, if it passes to the second plane, it's got to go between some atoms and then reflect off of an atom in the second plane. So, um, so what, what we, where we see the primary interference pattern. So that indeed all of this kind of scattering happens, but if the wave reflects off of the first atom, then the atom's in the way. It's not going to pass to the second one. The second wave has to come from another part of the wave, right? Because the wave takes up some space that has gone through and then scattered from a second atom. So this is the path that I really want to show. Um, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Let me redraw the picture. In order to scatter off of, let's say, this scatterer and this scatterer, right? So these are the scatterers. It's scattering just like kind of scattering we've seen before, in order to scatter off of both of those scatterers, then the, the light wave, which you know, takes up space, um, has to, the one part of it has to reflect off of the first scatterer, and then another part of the light wave, I gotta get it right, has to reflect off of the sc second scatterer. There we go. Okay, that made it between the planes, right? So you have to be able to get between the planes. So now, um, how much farther has one of these gone relative to the other? Well, let's just look at, let me draw a perpendicular 
hello. So that if, uh, if I draw a perpendicular there, where this is a perpendicular, we draw a perpendicular there, this is perpendicular, so that these two waves have gone the same distance, these two waves have gone the same distance, and the extra distance is, I don't know exactly what color to draw it, let's draw it in green, the extra distance is this and this. So it's this little extra distance here. So let me, so I've redrawn this picture here a little bit bigger, and let's do the extra distance. The extra distance that the bottom wave travels is that right there. It's made up of two little, the two little purple pieces. If we call this the angle theta, then you should be able to see that this is also angle theta. And so that the little purple piece, if this line here is D, right? That's the distance, the spacing between the atoms. Then that little purple piece is simply D sine theta. So the total extra distance is 2d sine theta. That's the total extra distance traveled. And by in, the, the properties of interference, the extra distance traveled um, will show a constructive interference if that is equal to an integer number of wavelengths. And it'll show destructive interference if it's a half integer number of wavelengths difference. So it gives the angles where we should see constructive interference uh, fringes. So for n equals 1, that's the primary. So now we look at our screen over here, right? We put a screen up and we say, okay, so at some particular angle theta, we're going to see an interference fringe. And then at, for n equals 2, we're going to get a different lambda. And we see another interference fr fringe for n equals 3, right? That's the uh, second and the third interference fringe, etc. Um, so that gives us the interference, the, the interference pattern, n equals 1, n equals 2. And this is, not, this is not quantum number. This has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. This has to do with interference and the fact that when one wave travels um, uh, a, a single wavelength, far, uh, zero wavelengths farther than the other, one wavelength farther than the other, two wavelengths farther than the other, etc., um, that you'll get... Uh, constructive interference. So those constructive interference points are given by these um, integers n. And that's Bragg scattering. So what, what again, just to, to, to bring back together what we're talking about here, we're talking about um, the, the looking at the properties of the x-ray and see, we can see x-ray interference off of crystal planes because they're the right spacing in order to get pronounced interference of x-rays, which are much smaller wavelength than other kinds of radiation that we've looked at um, in 1912. Um, and so we see that x-rays certainly um, act like waves because they are indeed light waves. Although we've already, we then show in 1923 or whenever that was for Compton scattering that they also act like particles. Um, but that's about the quantum mechanics. We're showing this Bragg scattering because um, the next thing we're going to show is showing electron diffraction and electron interference off of crystal planes. Um, but in the meantime, we, I want to talk about um, the, 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 the assumption that electrons actually do have wave-like properties and this is what allows us to modify the um the property the the model of the atom and then show then the experiment that showed that electrons have wave-like properties so that's next <laughs>